All right, if you'll open with me to Mark 10, Mark chapter 10 this morning. We're addressing a big question in this sermon, a question that we see in our text. And that question is, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What must I do to inherit eternal life? Uh, This is asked of Jesus by a man of great wealth. And the answer that's given to him is is different than we might expect. Now, you may remember um, Paul and Silas are asked a similar question by the Philippian jailer in Acts 16. Um, You remember the story? So, of course, this is way on down the road after Jesus' death and resurrection. And and now in the book of Acts, uh, they are going and spreading the gospel message. Paul and Silas are in prison because of this. And, and there's this big earthquake that comes, right? As they're singing hymns there in, in, the, in, in the cell. And the, the doors come open. And the jailer, he's actually about to kill himself because you know, he realizes that if these prisoners go away, you know, if, if, if they escape on his watch, that he's a dead man anyway. And so um, right before he does, they, they say, stop, we're all here. And then the jailer asks Paul and Silas, again, a very similar question to what we see in our text this morning. A little bit different, though. He says, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And the answer that they give is this. They say, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. And that's a wonderful answer, right? It is absolutely true. Uh, That is at the very heart of the gospel, right? That by faith, by believing in Jesus, we are saved. Jesus himself proclaims the same truth in John 3, 16. Right? For God so loved the world, he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Right? So what must I do to inherit eternal life? Well, believe in Jesus, right? Whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. That's absolutely true. However, we see that in our passage this morning, Jesus says something quite different to the rich man. We'll see in our text that first, Jesus lays down the law. And then, when the man claims that he's kept the law from his youth, Jesus says this. He says, you lack one thing. Go sell all that you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. All right, so this is Jesus' response to the rich man in our passage this morning. And it actually uh, causes him um, basically to hang his head low and walk away. In verse 22, it says, Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Now, we'll read the text here in a moment, but but one might wonder why Jesus takes this approach, why he says what he says to this man. And I think the answer is, or at least part of the answer, is that Jesus could see into this man's heart, just as he can see into your heart and, and my heart. He knew that this man was not in a place of desperation and surrender. He did not have the desperation and surrender that he needed to have. And so in love, Jesus seeks to expose this in his answer. And sadly, we end up seeing two things that would keep this man from inheriting eternal life. We see that, first of all, he was relying upon his own works. And then we also see a refusal to truly repent and follow after Jesus. Specifically, we'll see that the idolatry of wealth uh, stood in his way. Uh, If you're well acquainted with uh, this passage, you'll know what he says here in general about wealth, and that is that it is easier for a camel to fit through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And indeed, with man, it is impossible, impossible, but with God... All things are possible. So I just kind of gave the sermon in a nutshell there. Um, but uh, we'll slow down now and, and, uh, and look at the text. This is titled, The Idolatry of Wealth and the Miracle of the Gospel. If you'd stand with me now as we read this together, Mark 10. We're going to read verses 17 through 27. And then at the very end of the sermon, we'll pick up um, some closing verses. But Mark 10, beginning in verse, 20, uh, in verse 17. And as he was setting out on his journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. 
You know the commandments. Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. And he said to him, Teacher, all these I have kept from my youth. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, You lack one thing. Go, sell all that you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. And Jesus, looking around, said to the disciples, How difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus said to them again, Children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Sorry, I I was finding how far I was going here. And they were exceedingly astonished and said to him, Then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With man it is impossible, but with God. But not with God, for all things are possible with God. Let's pray. God, there is a lot packed into this passage. And so I pray that you will give us wisdom to see it all and for us to piece it together, for us to understand what you were saying to this young man, this rich man, and what you're saying to us through this passage So I pray, Lord, that by your Spirit that you'll give us understanding and that we will yield to your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, before we get to our main points, just in these first few verses, I want you to notice something. Uh, Notice the exchange uh, concerning the title that this man gives Jesus. So in verse 17... He calls Jesus good teacher. He says, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And then Jesus' response to him is, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. So just real quickly, what's what's going on with this? Uh, My grandpa, he was a a man of few words, uh, which means that whenever he said something, it would really stick, right? And and I remember uh, one time, Somebody called him a good man, and he was a good man, by human standards, that is. Uh, but somebody said something about how he was a good man, and, and he uh, responded, no one is good but God, in a kind of a playful way. And of course, whenever he said this, clearly he was deflecting praise, right? He says, no one is good but God. But the question is, what, is, what was Jesus doing when he said this? I think Jesus was actually doing the opposite. right? Jesus was, he wasn't saying, hey, don't call me good. No one is good but God. But in fact, what Jesus was doing was he was drawing out the implications of these words. And he just kind of let them hang. Jesus tended to, kind of, to do this kind of thing. Right? So I, was, I thought of a few examples. I'll just give you one. One other, this is when Jesus is standing on trial. And, and the high priest says, he says, tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. And Jesus says, you have said it yourself. I think he's kind of doing the same thing here, right? Good teacher. And, 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 and now Jesus says, no one is good but God. So he's like saying, okay, connect the dots here. What are you saying? And are you willing to follow it through? Uh, are you willing to follow these implications through to the end? Because you see, that was really a big part of the problem here. Is that this man, yes, he recognized Jesus was a good teacher, but... He did not recognize that he was the divine son of God who is worthy of our worship and wholehearted devotion. So, of course, that's key, right? And Scripture makes it clear that that is who Jesus is. He's not just some kind of sage giving good advice, like, here's what you got to do to inherit eternal life. No, he is the way, the truth, and the life. And so that's one thing that this man certainly needed to understand, something that we need to understand But also this man needed to understand who he was, who he himself was. And that is a sinner in need of a Savior. And so right on the heels of that, right on the heels of Jesus pointing out the implications of of what what it means to call him good, he then turns to this man. He says, you know the commandments. And he lists a number of the commandments, right? In essence, he's saying, 
you want to know what you must do, here it is. Right? Because again, the question is, what must I do to inherit eternal life? I'll just bring this out. Uh, you know, I, I kind of made the parallel earlier between this and then way later on down the road, the question that's asked of uh, Paul and Silas. But notice with Paul and Silas, there's a subtle difference. What must I do to be saved? And especially if we look at the circumstances of the Philippian jailer, he was desperate. He was at a place of desperation and surrender. And he knew that he needed salvation from someone outside of himself. What must I do to be saved? Right, this man, what, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And, and so there's a subtle difference there. But also just in the what must I do, especially with this rich young man, he, 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 was, he was not looking to salvation outside of himself. He was looking for a way to achieve eternal life based on his own merit. And so Jesus says, okay, here's what you must do. You want to know what you must do? Here's the law. And he lays it out for him. And then he says in verse 20 that the, the man responds, he says, Teacher, all these I have kept from my youth, which that's really where we begin to see the problem. All right, so this is the first of two things that kept the rich man from inheriting eternal life. So the first point is this there are two things, two things that kept him from inheriting eternal life. And the first of these two is his reliance upon his own works. What must I do? To inherit eternal life. And again, he's, he, he says, I, I have kept all of these. I've kept these commandments from my youth. This is a really foolish path to go down, right? To presume that we can earn eternal life by keeping God's law. I wonder if any of you have ever taken part in a toothpick, uh, toothpick bridge challenge. You know what I'm talking about? Like where you're given like a, I don't know, maybe a hundred toothpicks or something and, and a few other supplies, maybe some scotch tape and rubber bands or whatever. And, and you have to make some kind of bridge and then you put weight on it, maybe a can of Coke or something. And it's kind of a contest to see, you know, which bridge can bear the most weight for the longest time. So it's, it's a fun thing if you've never done it, uh, you know, maybe you can, you can make, a, make a weekend of it. But um, this... What, what, what the rich man is doing here, relying on his own works to inherit eternal life. It, well, it's kind of like building a bridge over hell with toothpicks and then walking over it with the weight of your sin on your back. It is indeed a foolish thing. And it's not going to get you where you want to go. All of these I have kept since my youth, he says. This is at best superficially true. But none of us, including him, have fully kept even these few laws that Jesus lists here. Jesus makes that clear in his Sermon on the Mount. He says, you have heard it said, do not commit adultery. But I say to you, if you you look at a woman with lust in your heart, you've committed adultery in your heart. He says a very similar thing about murder, right? If you're angry with your brother, you're liable to judgment. Um, and so, so there's two of them right here that are listed. And so Jesus makes clear in his teaching that, okay, it's not just about some kind of superficial conformity to the law, right? These, these are matters of the heart. And so, so even if it was superficially true that, that this man had kept these things, he'd never killed anybody, never committed adultery, he had you know, never done any of these things, of course there's a much deeper issue that must be dealt with. Jesus makes that clear in his teaching And so, we know that um, he hadn't fully kept those. But then, with, with the rich man, Jesus actually hones in on a commandment that's not even explicitly mentioned in this conversation. He hones in on the first commandment. And we see that in, basically, the command that he issues for this man to sell all that he has and give it to the poor, give it to the poor and follow Jesus, and then... He, uh, he refuses to do so. He's really honing in on the first commandment. Um, kids, any of you remember what the first commandment is? Anybody give a go at it? That's a good guess, but that's not the first one. That's one of them, but that's not the first one. The first commandment. What about adults? What's the first commandment? You shall have no other God before me. 
right? You shall have no other God before me. Or we might call this idolatry, right? To have other gods. And, and, what, and what might this rich man's God be? Yeah, his wealth, money, yeah. I think, I think we see that clearly in this passage. Again, even though, even though the first commandment isn't explicitly uh, mentioned here, basically what he's, he, well, he says you lack one thing, right? And then he, he goes into hone up on the very first commandment, right? Okay, you think you've kept all these? Well, first of all, again, we see clearly this man, neither he nor, nor any of us have, have fully kept even those commands. But let's just start at the very first one. The very first one. He says, hey, you've already failed big time even on that. And of course, that's the very most important of them. You shall have no other gods before me. So that's what he's honing in on whenever he gives this command for uh, this man to sell all that he has and to give it to the poor and to follow him. We see that this man um, is failing at this commandment not merely because he's rich, but because he prefers these things over Jesus. All right, that's the heart of idolatry. Whether we're talking about wealth or success or worldly pleasures or, I mean, if you fill in the blank, whatever it might be, whatever you're putting before Jesus, whatever you are preferring before Jesus, that is an idol. That is idolatry. That is having another God before him. Look, look at verses 21 and 22 with me. Right, so this, this is where he really hones in on it. Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said, You lack one thing. Go sell all that you have and give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. And so we see the command in the first verse, and in that second verse we see his failure to keep it. We see that his his idolatry is exposed. So, um, if he were willing to surrender this idol, he would indeed have found forgiveness and freedom in Christ. When... When, when Jesus says, you lack one thing, I don't think he means by that that this is the only sin that you have, right? Because again, uh, we see throughout Jesus' teaching, it's clear that this man has, has not even kept these other commandments that he's claimed to have kept. All right, so when Jesus says, you lack one thing, he's not saying, okay, here's the one thing you have to do, and then you'll be perfect, and then you can earn your way to heaven, to eternal life. That's not what he means when he says you lack one thing. But he does mean, I think, that there was one thing that was keeping him from Jesus. And I think this may be true of a lot of people, right? Think about maybe people here this morning. Uh, but uh, we all might think of loved ones who, who have yet to bow the knee to Jesus. And we think, okay, so often there's just that one thing that's keeping them from it, right? One thing they're not willing to let go. One thing they're not willing to turn away from. One thing they're not willing to surrender. So with this man, it was his wealth. And if he had, if he had turned away from it, right, this was kind of a test that Jesus was giving him to expose his heart. If he was willing to give up that idol, if he was willing to turn to Jesus and follow Jesus and put his trust in Jesus instead of his own wealth, then he would have had forgiveness and freedom from sin. But he would not. I suppose there are a lot of ways to trap a monkey. That's kind of an odd thing to say, isn't it? <laughs> I suppose there are a lot of ways to trap a monkey. But I'll tell you one way, one way to trap a monkey. Have you, any of you heard of the, the coconut trap? Um, I actually like looked up because I wasn't even. I, I heard this many, many years ago. I wasn't sure if it was even real, but you can watch some videos of this uh, on, on YouTube. Um, basically, you, you you hollow out a coconut and just put some rice in there or, or some kind of treat, something that the monkey's going to want, and you make you make a little hole, a hole that's that's 
small enough for the monkey to fit his hand into it. But then when the monkey has a closed fist, it won't come out, right? And so what happens is the monkey puts his hand in there and he grabs hold of the rice or whatever's in there. And then he just, he just is pulling and pulling and pulling and going crazy, but he will not let go. All he'd have to do is just simply let go and slip out his hand. But he won't do it, right? He, he's not able to, to, to see the, the short term versus the long term, right? And he's, he's, he's not, uh, he, just, he just can't do it. And that's how it was with this rich man. And that's how it is with so many people in the world today. I mean, I think we could say this of anyone who does not bow the knee, who does not surrender to Jesus. Whether we're talking about wealth or, again, fill in the blank, whatever that idol might be, so many people you just will not let go of it. Maybe there's just that one thing that you won't let go of in order to turn to Jesus in faith and repentance. Did I say, I, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I actually didn't even give the, the, the second of these um, two ways in which the rich man, um, like, what, what was that first point? Two things kept the rich man from inheriting eternal life. So the first is his reliance on his own works. Uh, the second is his refusal to truly repent and follow Jesus. All right, so you can file a lot of what I just said under that, right? You lack one thing, right? Not only was he relying on his own works and, 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 and saying, um, oh, yes, I've kept all these things. What must I do? Not only was he relying on his own works, but then that second thing was that he, he uh, refused to truly repent and follow Jesus. Because even though, even though we can't, we cannot earn our salvation. That, that's, that's a big point of this passage, right? That, that he, uh, he presumed that he could, and Jesus kind of played his game, right? And said, okay, here's what you must do. But, but the fact is, the law exposes us. It shows us our need for a Savior. It shows us our need for Jesus. And so, he relied upon his own works. That was part of it. But, but also, there is, there is a turning away from sin that is required, right? Faith and repentance are two sides of the same coin. And so, so you've got to let go of something in order to follow Jesus. You've got to turn from your sin in order to, to, to turn toward him and follow after him. And so, and so there's the balance here, right? Like, like there was something that was required of this rich man. It, and it wasn't that he was to earn his way, because the whole point is that he thought he could earn his way, but what he really needed was a desperation and a surrender. And so we might even, you know, earlier I used those terms, desperation and surrender. And so we can really kind of pair that up with these two things that kept him from inheriting eternal life, right? So, so first, when he was relying upon his own works, that means he didn't have a desperation, right? He didn't see how sinful he was and how he needed Jesus, how Jesus was his only hope. He didn't have the desperation. And then number two, when it says that he, uh, he refused to repent and turn to Jesus, he didn't have surrender, we need a desperation and surrender. That is part of the essence of saving faith. All right, so number two. Second point now. Specifically, the idolatry of wealth stood in his way. So verse 22 is, is haunting. Right? Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Matthew 6, 24, Jesus says, No one can serve two masters, for he will either hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Now, having a lot of money doesn't automatically make you idolatrous. Money itself is not evil. Of course, 1 Timothy 6, 10 tells us that the love of money is the root of all evil. So money... Having money doesn't make you idolatrous. But money is itself dangerous because it is so easy to love. Right? And so there's a warning here. There's a warning in this passage. Verse 23, he looked around and he said to the disciples, how difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus said to them again, children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Springs to mind also Proverbs 30, uh, 8 through 9. 
Proverbs says this, Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with food that is needful for me. Lest I be full and deny you and say, Who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of my God. Are right, you following that? Um, I think there's, there's wisdom in this proverb, right? That, that there, there's a danger both to being poor and to being rich, right? So he says, give me neither poverty nor riches because if, if, I, if I'm rich, then maybe I'm going to forget you. I'm going to be self-reliant. I'm going to have pride and, and I'm going to fall to all these dangers. Idolatry, right? Maybe I will forget you, but if I'm poor, then perhaps I would steal and profane your name. And so he says, give me neither poverty nor riches, So that may be a good prayer to pray. But even so, in God's providence, many do become rich. And there's nothing inherently wrong with being rich. In fact, God uses wealthy people in incredible ways. There's a sacred stewardship there. So if you find yourself in a place where where you've got some dough, recognize the stewardship that you have. And I think that, uh, well, I know the Bible speaks to enjoying wealth to the glory of God and with thanksgiving. There's a place for that. But our passage this morning, this, this passage is mainly a warning that there are great dangers of which we must be aware. Right? So again, you know, having wealth in and of itself is not a sinful thing. In fact, it is a sacred stewardship and it's something that can be counted as a blessing but but you can't lose sight of the dangers of the dangers that are involved now a lot of you might be thinking okay well i'm going to tune out because i know i'm not rich and and so so maybe uh you're not really relating to this but i think this relates to all of us more than we might realize because even if you're not rich by american standards I bet all of us here are pretty, pretty darn rich. So uh, you can look this up online. I, I didn't write the name of the website. You can, you can Google it and find it pretty easily, I think. Um, but uh, why don't you look, you look that up for me, Emily? I know I, I had you pull it up the other day. Um, but you can basically type in your, your income and the, the size of your family. So I'll just give, I'll give like a, uh, what a lot of people, I mean, most people would by no means consider this rich. Let's say you are a family of four and you make $40,000 a year as a family of four, right? Most people would say, okay, that's not rich. But I don't know, what do you think? What do you think I, like um, uh, on, on a global scale, what percentile you think that person's in? A family of four, $40,000. Were you guessing? The top 2%? Okay, well, now, now you're going to make it look not as, not as uh, um, shocking. Um, <laughs> you're in the top 86%. You're richer than 86% of the people in the world. Now, to get to that 2%, I mean, probably a lot of us here are in the top 2%. Um, I, I bet many, many of us here are in the top 2%. Uh, but even if you're a family of four, $40,000 a year. You are richer than 86% of the people in the world. Or your um, wealth is 5.3 times the global medium. 5.3 times richer than others. Did you find the website? Well, you have to Google how rich am I. Okay. How rich am I? Okay, so yeah, Google how rich am I calculator, and it'll, it'll come up. All right. Um, so, so there, there's, there's an application to all of us. That's the warning for all of us. Do not forget the Lord. Do not neglect to pray. Give us this day our daily bread, even when your pantries are full. Right? We might, you know, we've got so much food in our pantries. You know, oftentimes it's like, okay, things are expired. I've got to get rid of stuff. You know, that's kind of like how it is here in the United States of America. And, and, and we just, we, we don't realize how, strange that is um, in comparison to the rest of the world, especially as we look throughout world history, right? And so, so our pantries are, are full, and I don't know, that can keep us from, you know, it says in the Lord's Prayer, give us this day our daily bread, right? There is to be a daily dependence upon God, but in our wealth, sometimes we lose sight of that. So that's just kind of one real practical way, but I think there's many ways in which that might apply, And so there's a danger there, right? Of course, 
Even more dangerous is that we would prefer riches or anything at all over Jesus. That we would rely upon, that we would even prefer riches more than Jesus. You remember the old chorus, Lord, you are more precious than silver. Lord, you are more costly than gold. Lord, you are more beautiful than diamonds, and nothing I desire compares with you. Number three, the miracle of the gospel is that even a rich man, and even you, can be saved. Now, it might sound odd at first to say that the miracle of the gospel is that even a rich man can be saved, but it comes straight from the text here. All right, remember, Jesus had just said that it was easier for a camel to fit through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And then in response to that, the disciples, it says in verse 26, and they were exceedingly astonished, and they said to him, then who can be saved? Right? Who can be saved? If it's that difficult, who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With man it is impossible, but not with God, for all things are possible with God. And that is the miracle of the gospel. It does indeed take a miracle, right? Not only for a rich man, but for any man, woman, or child to enter the kingdom of God. It takes a miracle. You see, this passage is, is heavy on the law. I, I began by pointing out the differences between how Jesus responds here versus um, you know, Paul and Silas to the Philippian jailer with a very similar question, or even Jesus in John 3.16, right? Whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. It's absolutely true. But the reason why Jesus responds the way that he does, again, it's because he knows this man's heart. He's seeking to expose the things that are standing in the way and he's using the law to do that. Right? It's important that we understand the use of the law. And I think Jesus does this often. Right? Jesus uses the law. He kind of lays down the law in a, in a heavy manner to show us our desperate need of a Savior. I mean, you know, in, in the, in the um, Sermon on the Mount I mentioned earlier, Jesus says, you know, you've, you've heard it said, but I say to you. He kind of ratchets, ratchets it up, saying that it's, it's a matter of the heart and, and, and nobody is innocent. And then even to make, even to, to raise the bar higher, you know, kind of after that whole, um, uh, that, that whole section of the Sermon on the Mount, he says, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. You must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Jesus is laying down the law to show the high standard so that we will have the desperation that is required, right? The desperation, the surrender, the faith, in Jesus and not in ourselves. All right, so this passage is heavy on the law, but the purpose is to point us to the gospel. Right? It's to point us to the gospel, which is where the miracle is found. You might remember the opening line of, Mark, of the book of Mark is the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. All right, that's what it's all about. It says the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And the word gospel, it means good news. And the good news is that Christ came to save sinners, which would ultimately be accomplished through the cross. Right? And maybe that's part of the way Jesus speaks the way that he does, because, of course, he has not yet gone to the cross, and so there's not the explicit faith in the cross yet. That at, least, at least it's not made as clear as on the other side. But that's ultimately how Jesus would accomplish this salvation, and that is ultimately the heart of the gospel that we believe in Jesus, but specifically that we believe in what he has done for us through his life, death, and resurrection. And so again, this is where the miracle is found, right? When it says that with, with man it is impossible, with God all things are possible. How can any of us enter the kingdom of God? Because of what Jesus has done. Because of who he was, because of his life, death, and resurrection on our behalf. The word gospel also appears in our text this morning in the final verses on which we'll close. So let's look now to verses 28 through 31, which we've yet to read. Peter began to say to him, See, we have left everything and followed you. And Jesus said, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mothers or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel. 
who will not receive it a hundredfold. Now in this time, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. Now, I could preach a whole sermon on on that section, but I'm going to be brief. First of all, understand that the gospel is indeed a free gift. It's not purchased by our good deeds or anything of our own doing. Right? And again, I think that that's part of the strategy that Jesus is using here is, is, is to show this rich man that he hasn't kept all the law. And that, well, what Paul later says, by works of the law, no one is justified because we're all sinners. We all need a Savior. And Jesus wanted him to see that. He wanted, he wanted this, young, this, this rich young man to come to him with, with desperation and surrender. But instead, he was coming with self-sufficiency. And, in fact, refused to surrender to Jesus. And so, the gospel, yes, it is a free gift purchased by Jesus. But there, there's a faith that connects us to the gospel. And that faith, it does require a, a kind of desperation and a surrender. It requires us to look outside of ourselves, to look to Jesus. And with this rich young man, of course, you know, Jesus is not calling all of us to go and sell all of our possessions and give it to the poor. He might be calling some of us to do that. But specifically, he's speaking here to this young man. And, 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 and this is the test that he gives to him. And even though, even though he's not speaking that directly to us, and even though it's not required of us that we go and sell all of our possessions and give it to the poor, we can still kind of apply the same test and say, am I willing to do that? Let's say Jesus did say that to you, just as he did to this rich man. What would you do? Would you sell all that you had and follow Jesus? Or would you hang your head and walk away sorrowful? That really is a, a test of, of, of whether or not you have that desperation and that surrender to Jesus. And sadly, this man did not. And what a tragedy it was. What a tragedy it would be for any of us to refuse that. Yes, because of the eternal life that comes through faith in Jesus. But... You know, these final verses, and this is something that I think is easy to miss, and, and uh, you know, it's kind of, kind of wordy here in this last section. But notice these final verses assure us that even in this life, there are great blessings to following Jesus. Because you see, the disciples, they come to Jesus and they say, okay, well, we have given everything up, right? Because maybe, maybe they're kind of worried, right? You know, Jesus just said that, hey, you know, it's, it's more difficult uh, for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God than it is, or it's easier for a camel to fit through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And, and, and so they, you know, they're, they're a little bit kind of concerned. Like, okay, this it sounds like it's kind of hard to enter the kingdom of God. Say, Jesus, look, we have given up these things. And, and of course, again, it's not that they earned their salvation by doing so, but that they showed that they were trusting and treasuring Jesus. But Jesus' Jesus's response to them is twofold. First, he says that, look at verse 30, and, and we're, almost, we're almost finished here, but in verse 30, he says, uh, well, we'll back up to 29. He says, Truly I say to you, there's no one who has left houses or brothers or sisters or mothers or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time. Right? He says, now in this time. And he says, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. So what does he mean now in this time? Well, I don't think that he means that, you know, that they are literally going to, uh, that they have this promise of, of, of their own personal wealth. But there is a blessing that he is referring to. He's saying, if, if you give up these things for my sake, then you're going to receive it a hundredfold now in this time. And so uh, some interpreters have, have suggested, and I think this is right, that, that he's referring to the, the fellowship of other believers, the hospitality of other believers, right? You've given up your mother and your brother and your sisters, but now you have a family in Christ. 
You've given up your house and your lands, but, but now you're welcomed into the homes of others. And so the fellowship and the hospitality, right? There is something to gain even in this life, right? Oftentimes, and rightly so, we point to this eternal life that we're striving for and that, yes, there are persecutions that we will suffer. And Jesus even says that here, right? These persecutions are mingled in with all these other blessings. But he says, now in this time, you will receive a hundredfold with persecutions. But then in the age to come, eternal life. And so, of course, that is ultimately the goal because that's forever. Right? That's, a lot, that's a lot longer than you know, the 80, 90 years, if we're lucky, that we have here on earth. So, um, eternal life. Well, again, the main point of this passage this morning is that the way to eternal life is not self-sufficiency. It's certainly not idolatry. Right? And that's what we see in this rich man. That's what kept him from the kingdom of God. That's what kept him from eternal life. His self-sufficiency and his idolatry. He was not willing to surrender to Jesus. He wasn't willing to, um, to repent. And so, um, there's a desperation and a surrender that is required of us, a trusting in, a treasuring in Jesus and the gospel above all things. And so um, may we all trust in and treasure Jesus over and above all things. With man it is impossible, but all things are possible with God. Let's pray. God, we're thankful for the gospel. We're We're thankful for Jesus and his life, death, and resurrection on our behalf. And we pray, Lord, that by your spirit that you will help us to trust not in ourselves, but to trust in Jesus. For us to have that desperation and surrender that this man tragically did not have. Help us to look to Christ and to Christ alone. And to be willing to follow him. And even to give up everything for him. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.